five. Wait a second. Brother Ernie's coming in the door. Hold on a second. You can't start the countdown until uh, Brother Ernie gets in the door. Come on, Brother Ernie. Step across the threshold. Come on. Five, four, three, two, and one. All right, Brother Ernie. Those uh, lights that were flickering just a little while ago brought back flashbacks of uh, platform shoes and leisure shoot suits. And then those of you that are younger than 40 are saying, what the heck is he talking about? <laughs> All right. Everybody have an announcement? Anybody need one? Anybody need one? All right. Good job, guys. Getting those out to everybody. Uh, as you can see here on the inside cover, uh, there's a schedule there for nursery givers and cleaning givers. If you are, uh, please take note of when your time is coming up. And if you would like to be added to the cleaning list, please let Wanda Boykin know. It's about, uh, rotation's about every six weeks, okay? Our July business meeting is going to be on July 17th instead of the 10th, okay? That'll be 7 o'clock Wednesday, July 17th. Young at Heart outing Tuesday, July 9th, Ponderosa Steakhouse in Buffet in Lawrenceburg. Leaving the church at 10 a.m. Is that it? That's too simple, Tim. 10 a.m. Not 9.59? Okay, okay, 10 a.m. All right. And there's items there, as you can see, for Operation Christmas Child for July. Monetary gifts can be given to uh, Miss Evelyn or Tim. And if you would like to be on the prayer request, email, please see Wanda Boykin or Billy Harwell. Now, um, as you know, we're referring now to our Sunday school classes as connect groups because that's absolutely what they are. That's what they're intended to be. Uh, this is awesome, what we're doing right now, but right now we are worshiping, okay? We're not fellowshipping. And these connect groups are all about the fellowship, getting to know one another, growing in Christ, by getting to know one another and sharing with one another. And we've got several of these going on right now and excited to say that there's going to be another one. Oh, i got to stop looking at you over my glasses. Kim said, stop that. That's bad, terrible. But anyway, I don't know if this improves. Anyway, uh, Aaron Hovis is going to begin another connect group, okay, starting another connect group on July 14th, okay? So if you would like to grow in your faith and if you would like to get to know people a little bit better, get, have people get to know you a little bit better um, and grow in your faith at the same time, I highly encourage you to get, uh, get involved in a connect group, okay? And if you have any questions and would like to, please see me after service and I'll get you hooked up, all right? Uh, Aaron, anything you'd like to add? No, sir. All right, very good. Uh, any any new people today? Any visitors visiting us for the first time? All right. Hi. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you for coming. Anybody else? Well, if you are new and you didn't raise your hand, uh, we welcome you and and uh, glad to have you with us this morning. Anything else that needs to be added to the announcements that haven't hasn't been? Okay. Well, fellas, at this time we'll take up the uh, Lord's offering.
Blessed Father, as we come into your house this morning, dear Lord, to sing praises to you and to hear your word, Father. Dear Lord, I just ask that you touch each and every one of our hearts and our minds. That as we walk out of the service, dear Lord, that we take the message that Brother Matt is going to bring us this morning that you've laid upon his heart. Help us dissect it, think about it, and see how we can change our lives, dear Lord, to glorify you. So that's why we're here, dear Lord, to glorify you. Not to glorify us, but to glorify you. You sent your son down to die upon the cross, dear Lord, to wipe us white as snow. And we just thank you so very, very much, dear Lord. So, Father, if we take up this offering, we just ask, dear Lord, that you bless it, and that you be with us as we administer to the community, the city of Lewisburg, dear Lord, and to our own people. Touch us and guide us, dear Lord, for you are our Savior, our guider, and our protector. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <laughs> stand shake hands with our Christian neighbors this morning. shepherd leads us much we need thy tender care Savior like a shepherd lead us much we need thy tender care blessed Jesus blessed Jesus thou hast brought us thine we are blessed Jesus Blessed Jesus, Thou hast brought us Thine, we are. You have promised to receive us, poor and sinful though we be. You have mercy to relieve us, grace to cleanse and power it free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, let us turn, let to, us turn to Thee. Early let us seek Thy favor, early let us do Thy will. 
blessed Lord and only Savior, with thy love our beings filled. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, love us still. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast loved us, loved us still. For Jesus, your King, there's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you do so? Praises to sing, there's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power. In the precious blood of the Lamb. Oh, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. Everything to God in prayer Oh, what peace we often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear All because we do not carry Everything to God in prayer have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful? Who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden, cumbered with the load of care? Pray. Precious Savior, still our refuge, take it to the Lord in prayer. Do thy friends despise or sake thee, take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find a solace there. Thank you. You may Thank be you. seated.
Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody here this morning. Y'all doing all right? Yeah, summer, right? Hot? Wait till we turn up the temperature in here, about 85 degrees, right? Then y'all have something to complain about. Now, it's good to see everybody here this morning. Uh, a few announcements before we get going here this morning. Uh, just, I'm going to keep, keep saying it until it happens. July 27th, that's a Saturday, we're doing our Hannah's Gap. It's our one-day mission trip VBS Blitz down there. Uh, if you're new here wondering, Hannah's Gap, VBS, what's all this, what's all this he's talking about here? Uh, Hannah's Gap Baptist Church is a small church down in Petersburg, uh, just down the road down here. They're a smaller church, an older church, and uh, they don't have the resources um, available to them to be able to host a VBS. Now, they still have the same task, the same mission that we do here at Mount Moriah to be able to go and to reach the children around them. Uh, and so that's where we come in uh, here at Mount Moriah. And so what we're going to do is we're going to bring the people, we're going to bring the hot dogs, we're going to bring the, the teachers and the food and all these things. We're going to bring it down there, and we're going to host a one-day VBS mission for them uh, just to kind of undergird them so, you know, and support them uh, so that they can accomplish their task there in Petersburg. If you're interested in that, we've got a lot of slots filled up. We've got some, some room still for some more volunteers. If you're interested in that, come see me after service. I, I, I encourage you to be part of that. We're going to leave here early in the morning. We're going to be back early in the afternoon. It's a one-day thing. You still get some of your Saturday, and at the same time, you really get to make an impact in the local area around here and come alongside and encourage and, some, and so support a sister church. If you are serving, and I know who you are, Okay, so don't, don't think you can get out of it. If you are serving, come, you need to come see me after service anyways. We're going to have just a short, maybe five-minute meeting where I kind of lay out some of the details for you guys, get you straight on. If you're doing games or you're doing, you know, you're doing the craft, you're doing the songs, whatever you're doing, come see me after service anyways so I can get you straight so you guys can get ready. All right? I said I wasn't going to mention baby bottles anymore, didn't I? Yeah, I did. Well, I lied. I lied. I love talking about baby bottles, especially when you guys put $1,000 inside those baby bottles. That is what you guys did here over the course of four or five weeks. Thank you so much, Mount Moriah. You guys knocked it out of the park as usual. Uh, I expect nothing less from you guys. You did an amazing thing. Our ladies took that check along with a bunch of empty baby bottles uh, over to the Pregnancy Resource Center here. I believe it was Wednesday night y'all went out there, got to tour the facilities, meet some of the workers out there. Thank you guys again. Just thank you, thank you, thank you. They thank you. And uh, just a wonderful ministry that you guys are, are now a part of. Uh, that you guys came alongside and supported like that. So thank you again. Uh, look to see that again, I believe, next Mother's Day. We're going to do it again. And $1,000 ain't going to cut it next year, guys. $1,000 ain't going to cut it next year. We're going to have to double that number. All right? So I'm going to have more baby bottles coming. You guys are going to have to dig a little deeper next year. So thank you again for doing that. Last thing, and then we'll get to some Bible time, I promise. You heard Brother Dave, our educational director, mention the, the change in our Sunday school hour. If you guys have been, been watching the, uh, the announcements there in the morning on the screen here, you've probably noticed a change. You've probably noticed a change in hearing some words about connect groups as opposed to Sunday school. One of the changes that we're looking to make here at Mount Moriah is a name change. Uh, Sunday school, while I, I love Sunday school, Sunday school no longer reflects necessarily what we're looking to do. Uh, and at the same time, Sunday school brings with it a lot of baggage. Well, right, let's face it, Sunday school brings with it a lot of, a lot of baggage that when we try to reach out to the world, um, hey, come join my Sunday school class, maybe either one, they don't necessarily know what Sunday school is, or two, they may have a negative connotation about what Sunday school actually is. Now, maybe those are true, maybe those aren't true, but either way, those are, are mountains we've got to overcome. One of, the com one of the complaints, one of the things that I see so much, not, not just here at Mount Moriah, but, but Lewisburg and just around the country, is that of loneliness. You know, we are we're more connected than ever, aren't we? And we've got devices and, and, and we've got all these things. We're more connected than we've ever been in human history. But at the same time, we're more lonely than we've ever been, aren't we? We are more lonely and disconnected from people. We're around them all the time, but at the same time, we're not connected with anybody. And that's one of the things we're seeking to change here. Seeking to change that to bring connection and fellowship into this church here. It can start with us. And so we're looking to do a name change. Connect groups. We're looking to connect people with one another. Right? Maybe that's you. Maybe you're, you're finding yourself without friends. Maybe you're finding yourself without anybody to, to, to do life with, to share life with, to talk to about. And so I want to encourage you. If you're not in one of these groups, I want to encourage you to get in one of these groups. 
We've got a lot of new groups. We, we used to have only just a couple here, here at the church. We're starting a lot of new ones. The groups are going to be smaller. They're going to be a little more intimate, and they're going to be a, a lot more. You're going to have time to build relationships with one another here at the church. So if you're not in a group, right, if you're not in one of these classes, I want to encourage you. We've got a new, we just had a new one start up in the, in the tech loft up there a couple weeks ago. We've got another new one starting, what is that, next week? Uh, two weeks now. Two weeks from now, we've got another new one starting, and uh, hopefully we have a bunch more new ones starting here soon. And so I want to encourage you, if you're not in a group, get in a group. Get connected here at Mount Moriah. It's the way that as we grow, as we, as we kind of increase here at Mount Moriah, it's going to be one of the ways that you guys get connected, that you get to know your brother and sister in Christ, that you get to know others in the community, that you get to build some deeper relationships here at Mount Moriah. So, again, I want to encourage you, get connected in one of these groups. Get, in, get involved in one of these groups. And then let me speak to you. There's going to be a couple out here in, this, in the congregation here this, this morning that I know that God's leading to lead one of these groups. I know right here that, that in here this morning that God is prompting, working in the hearts of several of you to get out there, to take that step of faith and to lead one of these groups. If that's happening in your life, if you feel God kind of prompting you that, maybe you're scared, maybe you don't know what to do, whatever it is, come see me. We can help you get through it, right? We're not going to just kind of leave you out there on your own. We'd only do that with just a couple folks, right? But for the rest of y'all, we're not going to do that to you guys, right? We want to make sure that you guys, that you, that you grow, that you flourish, that you do well in these ministries. And so if you feel the Lord leading you something like that, come see me. Come see Brother Dave. Uh, we're going to get you pointed in the right direction. Make sure you've got exactly what you need in order to go out and to, to make, make the name of the Lord great, right? So... Here we find ourselves. We're VBSing, and we've got connect groups, and we've got baby bottles, and we've got all kinds of things going on, don't we? We're looking at reaching out to the Japanese here in our local community. Um, if we're about, I'd say, three-quarters of the way done here with this Healthy Church series, uh, where we've been looking at 12 unique, distinct characteristics of church, things that define church, make, things that make us different than, say, a regular Christian group. Uh, if you're new to us here this morning, if you haven't been with us here in a while, I want to encourage you, you can find those sermons online on our YouTube channel, on our website there. Go ahead and check them out. What we're doing is we're looking at seeing what Scripture says about those unique characteristics. What does Scripture say about being a member of a church? What does Scripture say about giving? What does Scripture say about evangelism, discipleship, all these things? Seeing what Scripture says, and then what is our response? What do we, as the church, what do we need to do in order to get healthy in regards to these, these uh, characteristics here? Because it's vitally important for us, as a church, to be healthy. The reason being is we have a mission, don't we? We, as a church, have a mission to go out, to glorify the Lord, to make disciples of every single person, to go out and to, and to see his name lifted up across the entire world. And we cannot do that if we're not healthy. Right? Just like going out and being, being a you know, professional athlete, you cannot go out and do that if, you're, if your body is not in its peak physical condition. And so it's vitally important. If we're to fulfill this mission, we need to be healthy. We need to go out and to make the changes that Scripture says we need to make in order to fulfill the mission that God is calling us to fulfill. Right? So even if you have been here for, for the past 10 weeks or so, even if you have been here listening to these sermons, I encourage you, go back. Go back, listen to them again. Let Scripture speak to you. Let Scripture kind of punch you like it's supposed to do at times. And this is not right. This is not the way that you're supposed to be living. You need to make some changes in order to get in line with what Scripture says so that we, as a group, can get healthy and get on mission for the Lord. So today, today it brings us to what is called biblical ordinances. Biblical ordinances. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking snooze fest. Well, Maybe. So, <laughs> now, hold on. Now, this, this is good stuff. This is good stuff here. Biblical ordinances. Biblical ordinances. Let me take you to our theme verses here. Turn with me to Acts chapter 2. Uh, if you're new here, this is, uh, this is our theme verses that we've been in. Acts chapter 2, we generally start in verse 42, where we see kind of the picture of the early church there. Today, back up one verse with me in your copy of Scripture, verse, starting in verse 41. And as you're turning, I would invite you to, to join me in, a, in time of prayer. God, I thank you again for this opportunity that you've given us to gather. Lord, the opportunity that you've given us, Lord, to, to come to you in prayer. Lord, to worship your great name. Lord, to, to read your word. Oh, God, I pray that as we read, as we study, Lord, I ask that your spirit would speak to each and every one of us, Lord. 
Oh, God, call us out on our sin, Lord. Call us out on the way that we're living that is contrary, Lord, to how you would have us live. God, help us as a church here. Help us to get healthy. Lord, help us to begin living a life, Lord, that is set apart for you. Lord, a life that pleases you, a life that glorifies you. God, help us, Lord, to accomplish your will here on earth. God, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us, Lord. God, I pray that we would be found faithful, Lord, in being, in being found obedient unto your word. And God, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Acts chapter 2, right, this is a picture, this is the end of Peter's sermon, then beginnings kind of, uh, verse 42 kind of begins a description of uh, the early church and what they were doing. Join me in verse 41 of Acts chapter 2. Verse 41, Acts chapter 2, it says this, So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. Verse 42, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. We've read these verses a, a bunch of times here over the past few weeks, haven't we? We've been here, been here quite a bit. You see in verse 41, you see in verse 42, you see a couple things happening, all right? We see verse 41, we see 3,000 people being baptized. Verse 42, we see the church, the early church now, all right, break, being con devoted to the breaking of bread. Now, this breaking of bread is in a reference to the taking of the Lord's Supper. This is not their meals, right? That's talked about later on, that they were taking their meals together. You can look in verse 46. Verse 42 is referring to the taking of the Lord's Supper. So before we get down here, let me give you what, an, what a definition of an ordinance is, right? Maybe you've heard this word, maybe you haven't. Ordinance is a $10 theological word that basically means a prescribed practice or a ceremony. Right? A prescribed practice or ceremony. Basically, there are certain ceremonies, certain practices that have been given to us, the church, by Jesus himself, right? for us to follow and us to carry out. You guys just read about them here this morning, right? Maybe you've been involved in them. Maybe you've seen them here at Mount Moriah. Maybe you've seen them at other churches. Maybe you've done them, them yourselves. Lord's Supper, right, and baptism. Those are the two ordinances that have been given to the church, okay? Church, not just Mount Moriah Church. I'm talking church church, right? The, the one that, that extends across, you know, time and, and extends across this earth here. That church has been given to us to carry out right? It's what makes us a church. Many of you have probably been to Christian groups. Maybe you've been to a, a Christian Bible study, right? It's a group of Christians, okay? Maybe you pray, maybe you read the word, but you're not a church yet. There's one of the reasons you're not a church, and that's because you don't actually celebrate, you don't observe these ordinances, okay? Right? These are one of the things that distinguish us, that set us apart as a church, we celebrate, we observe the Lord's Supper. We observe baptism. It's what helps set us apart as a church. Now, a lot of questions on these. Like I said, maybe you've seen them, maybe you've done them. I would imagine many of you have done these. In fact, uh, some of you, I've actually baptized here myself. So I know that you've gone through some of these things before. But there's a lot of questions, aren't there? When we talk about ordinances, right, there's, always, there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of controversy. There's a lot of issues that surround them. Why do we do it, right? What is it? What are we even doing, okay? You know, why bother? What are they, right? We, there's a lot of questions. If we're honest with ourselves, we've often thought, you know, we've had some of these questions. Maybe you're here this morning. You've got some questions about Lord's Supper. You've got some questions about baptism. What do they mean? Is there, in, is there even any meaning at all? I thought it meant this, or I thought we'd... Today, we're going to see what Scripture says, because these are ceremonies, these are practices that have been given to us by Jesus, right, for us, the church, to celebrate. We, as a church, need to be healthy here, just as we need to be healthy in our worship, just as we need to be healthy in our prayer, just as we need to be healthy in membership and all these other topics. The celebration and the observance of biblical ordinances is something that we, as a church, need to be healthy and we need to be biblical on, right? So here we go, right? So we're going to look at three questions today. First, biblical ordinances. What are they? Right? What are they? Second, what do they mean? Or is there even any meaning at all in them? And then third, why bother? Why do we even celebrate them? So first, let's start with what are they? I'm going to give you two words for each of them. All right? I'm going to give you two words for each of these. So baptism, the four words that I'm going to give you, okay, are this, repentance and immersion. 
Okay, repentance and immersion. So keep those in mind. That's going to help your understanding of what baptism is. Right? Baptism, a basic definition is this. Going in or underwater in the name of Christ. Simple definition. All right? Simple definition of baptism. All right? We actually get the word from the Greek word baptisma or baptismio. Okay? That's where the word, our English word baptism comes from. Now, the word baptism doesn't appear until the New Testament. We actually don't see the word in the Old Testament at all. All right? But when we do see it, Matthew 3 there, all right, it's, it's established as kind of a normal thing. Right? We see Matthew 3, we see who? John the Baptist doing what? Baptizing folks. Right? He was there in the Jordan River, he was baptizing folks. And what's interesting to note is that this time in history, it wasn't a weird thing. Right? While we don't see it in the Old Testament, baptism, right? when John the Baptist comes on the scene, when Jesus comes on the scene, baptism is actually a normal thing. Most scholars believe that baptism was actually derived from Old Testament purification rituals. Right? We see so much in the Old Testament, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers there, God commanding the nation of Israel saying, okay, you need to approach me in a certain way. You can't just come to me in any way you want. There's a certain way in which you approach a holy God. You must be pure, right? You must be clean. And so there were so many rituals, so many things that they had to do in order to be pure and clean and right so that they could approach God. Most people believe that baptism kind of progressed from that, right? There's a, a, you go to Jerusalem and, and archaeologists have actually discovered lots and lots of baptismal pools all around the city of Jerusalem there where the practice of baptism was a fairly common thing. John the Baptist was likely not the only guy baptizing people. It was likely not a fad that he had just thought of like, oh man, this would be awesome. Like I could make a, you know, make a million bucks baptizing people out here. It wasn't anything like that at all, all right? It was, it was a, a common practice at that time. Now, what we see, though, okay, the word itself already denotes a, a meaning of immersion. The Greek word itself carries a lot of meaning of, of immersion, of actually going under water. Now, we see also the practice of what John the Baptist was doing there. Matthew 3, 6, right? People were confessing their sins, repenting of their sins, and being baptized by John in the Jordan, being dunked under water. So let's further refine baptism as this, okay? It's the act, right, by one who confesses, right, who confesses to follow Jesus, who has repented of their sins, is then immersed in water. We as Southern Baptists, that's what Mount Moriah Baptist Church, we are Southern Baptists here, and we reserve baptism only for those who by faith, okay, who by faith have chosen to follow Jesus and have repented of their sins. You see a scriptural practice of this, right? It's one of the reasons that we do not do infant baptism here at Mount Moriah. We as Southern Baptists do not do infant baptism. One, one I don't want to be responsible for taking a three-week-old and dunking his head underneath that water, okay? That's not something I want to have the liability for. Uh, they just can't hold their breath and uh, don't ask me how to that. No, don't. They can't hold their breath, okay? That's a matter of they just can't hold their breath. So we don't, we don't practice that here. Two, right, we see Scripture. We, we see in Scripture. In fact, go with me to Matthew 3, right? We can see this in Scripture here. You go to Matthew chapter 3, verse 6, and it says, And they were being baptized by him, John, in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins, okay? So what was the, what was the order of what we see in Scripture, right? They are confessing sins, being baptized, right? You see the same thing. You go over to Acts chapter 8. Philip, in his encounter with the Ethiopian eunuch, right? He meets the Ethiopian eunuch. You guys remember the story? He's reading the scroll of Isaiah, and he's like, hey, tell me about who, you know, who's this about, right? Philip goes and proceeds to explain Jesus and the gospel to him, right? Starting with that, that verse there in Isaiah. And then he takes him on and, and, and shares the gospel with him. After that encounter, they're traveling along, and what's the Ethiopian eunuch say? Hey, there's water. What prevents me from being baptized? Well, hey, nothing. Let's go over and get it done, right? Repentance, confession, baptism. There's a logical order of it on you. are thinking, oh, good grief. We know all this stuff, right? Well, this is one of the reasons that we do these things. It's, it's good for us to have a healthy start, a healthy foundation on what these things mean before we get kind of off base and get into other things. So, repent, so it's necessary for baptism that it always, always, always follows repentance and confession of sin, right? Lord's Supper. There's your two words. Representation 
proclamation. All right? So baptism, okay, is immersion and repentance, right? For Lord's Supper, our two words are going to be representation and proclamation. We see the Lord's Supper being observed well, throughout Scripture, okay? We see it here in Acts chapter 2, right? We see the early church, they're devoted to the practice of breaking bread, a reference to the Lord's Supper. We see Paul when he writes his letter to the Corinthians, right? He's actually kind of rebuking them for their craziness that, was in, that they were doing when they were taking the Lord's Supper. And so we see the Lord's Supper. We kind of see it throughout the New Testament. Here at Mount Moriah, Southern Baptists again, we, t- we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We celebrate in a unique way, though, don't we? When Jesus, right, the Lord's Supper, right, is in reference to Jesus and his last, the last supper that Jesus had with his disciples. They go into the upper room, right? Jesus is hours away from his death and, and from his crucifixion there. And what do they do? They celebrate the Passover meal. Jesus takes the cup. Jesus takes the bread. And he says what? This is my body, this is my blood given to you, right, for the forgiveness of sins, right? Do this in remembrance of me. And so Jesus, he, he gives us this practice, okay, he gives us this practice, right? But the problem is, you see us, we do what? We have grape juice and we have little tasteless things, uh, wafers, I don't know what we call them, we get them from Lifeway. I don't know, they come in a box of like a billion of them. Right? And so they're, they're completely flavorless, right? And you're thinking to yourself, well, this isn't unleavened bread and this isn't wine. You're right. It absolutely isn't any of that stuff. Right? Our goal is representation of what Jesus did. Right? Jesus didn't say, hey, like, y'all need to get yourself some first century wine and some first century unleavened bread because the bread and the wine is the most important part. The most important part was what? What Jesus said they symbolized, right? His body and his blood. And so we, as a church, seek not to duplicate what Jesus did. We seek rather, than, we seek rather to represent what Jesus did. These elements represent what Jesus was talking about. This cup represents his blood. This, this bread, this little small wafer thing, represents his body. Okay? So we're seeking to represent it. I've actually had the Lord's Supper with tea before. Uh, it, hey, it was fine, right? It's not so much about duplicating as it is about representing. Now, the second thing, the second thing word there you see is proclamation, right? One of, the, one of the elements of taking the Lord's Supper is that of proclaiming. Paul made mention of that in 1 Corinthians 11 there. For as often as you do this, you do what? You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again, right? When we take the Lord's Supper, we are proclaiming, right, that we, okay, are following Jesus, that we are in right relationship with him, and we are proclaiming this to the world, okay? So that's part of what the Lord's Supper is, all right? So just as baptism is limited to, say, those who have chosen to repent and follow Jesus, right? Baptism is limited to those folks only. Lord's Supper is also limited as well to those who follow Jesus, okay? We, we just don't turn this over, right? It's, it's not, really not even that good of a meal. Um, you, you're going to still have to hit McDonald's on the way home after that kind of thing, all right? It's not a meal, right? It's, it's, a, it's merely symbolism that is reserved strictly for those who by faith have chosen to follow Jesus Christ, right? Everybody straight on meanings? Here we go. All right. So you got the meanings, or you've got at least what they are. Now let's talk about some meanings. This is probably where we get the most confused on biblical ordinances. Well, I think, you know, I think baptism's about Jesus dying and then, boom, resurrection, and then I, I don't know what, you know, I don't even know what Lord's Supper means. And we, we're all confused on these things at times. We get confused on this. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians, right? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to start with baptism here. So your two words for baptism, for their meaning, are going to be burial and resurrection, right? Baptism, burial, and resurrection, right? Lord's Supper is going to be Jesus' death and second coming. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15, and look with me at verses 3 and 4. It says, For I deliver to you as of first importance what I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. All right, now turn with me to Colossians chapter 2. These are all on the screen too, by the way. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. It says this, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised up with him through, the, through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So, baptism 
is a representation of Jesus' burial and Jesus' resurrection. And you think about it, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it, right? As we go into the water, kind of signifying death, right? We are being buried, okay? We're going into the grave, just as Jesus was put into the tomb. We are now being placed into the tomb, all right? So now we're in there, right? And then as we're raised, okay, we're raised out of the water, significant, you know, signifying what? Jesus' resurrection. Guys, get in the picture now, right? You get in the picture here? That's exactly one of, the, one of the things that baptism signifies here is Jesus' burial and resurrection, all right? Now, it also, also in, a, in another way, signifies new life, right? As a Christian, okay, as a Christian, in fact, you can look 2 Corinthians 5 there, right? Go to 2 Corinthians 5. Verse 17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, the new things have come. Right? We're familiar with the verse. As a Christian, right, we die to ourselves. The old us dies, perishes, is gone. Okay? We are a new creation. So it's one of the things the gospel does. Okay? It sets us free from sin, sets us apart unto God, so that we would live the life that God desires for us to live. Baptism is, a, is another signifying indicator of that, right? As we, are, as we go underwater, right, the old us dies, okay? The old us is died, it's buried. As we're raised, right, now we're being identified not just with Jesus' resurrection, but we're identified as having new life, okay? This is one of those things that, that we, right, the Bible speaks very clearly. Romans 6, 4 says that we are raised, right, we are raised to a newness of life, it's one of the things about baptisms. It's one of the reasons why we do immersion baptism and not sprinkling, because it sends a clear picture as to what's going on, okay? A clear symbolism as to what's happening in the life of a believer, all right? So remember, right, remember about both of these things. These are both outward displays of what's happening in your heart. Outward displays of what's happening in your heart, all right? So we come to the Lord's Supper. Jesus' death, right, and Jesus' second coming. So the goal, remember, is not duplication. We're not trying to get our hands on first century wine or first century unleavened bread, anything like that. We're not trying to have it all set out just like Jesus would have had it set out. We're trying instead to represent what Jesus was talking about here, all right? You look at 1 Corinthians 11. I mentioned earlier, Paul talking about when you do this, okay, when you take the Lord's Supper, you are proclaiming, okay, you are proclaiming his death. When we take the Lord's Supper, when we celebrate it here, that is one of the things that we are proclaiming to the rest of the world and to others. That Jesus Christ, all right, by his, by his own admission, became our Passover lamb. All right? that was what, that's what was happening there at that Passover meal, the Last Supper that Jesus celebrated. Was Jesus was becoming our Passover lamb. He was going to become that spotless lamb that was required at every Passover for the sins of Israel. Only except Jesus was going to be better at it because he was a spotless, right? He was, he